Thank you and hello. I am very pleased to be here, both because of here and because of I am pleased to be. <laughs> and it's really also a privilege to be the third speaker because so much work has already been done. That's wonderful. I want to emphasize a side of, th this is a two-sided thing. They're both saying, and I will say, uh, experience, reality, people, whatever you want to talk about, doesn't really consist of entities, of defined, I mean there are entities and defined units, but it doesn't, nothing really consists of those. Everything is more than that. And there are two sides to saying that. One is that it's not understandable just in terms of what you can define and say. And the other, of course, is that it is understandable in how we live, how we are, what we speak from. And I want to emphasize, since I'm third and I get to do that, uh, the side of both speakers that brought you how we do understand more than and differently than in defined terms and concepts and entities and cut and dried distinctions and either ors and, and implicit taken as an entity all over again. Not only did they say, no, we don't, we are not limited to that, but they also said, we do, we are, we understand, we have something to say, we listen, we hear. Donnell was saying, it's got to fit. And then he had another word which I wrote down because, oh yes, the question is when you say something, does it do it justice? Well, we have now had 30 years of people emphasizing the un. It's not linear, it's not uh, defined, it's not, to the point where a lot of people gloried in upsetting everybody and saying there's nothing. There's nothing at the bottom. <laughs> we make it up. It's all interpretation, but there's nothing there to interpret, Nietzsche said. It's all, it's all, it's all uh, made up. There's nothing there. These people are well beyond that point, correct? You do it justice. It has to fit. It's not just the brain, it's the whole body, she said. So I heartily agree. It's not going to be reducible to neurology. When I was a student, I was supposed to be chemistry. Now I'm supposed to be neurology. <laughs> but you see, science advances. It makes more and more of these beautiful, helpful an analyses that help us make things. And let's not put down the technology that lets six billion people live in the world. Let's not put it down, but let's just understand that this human capacity to make entities doesn't do away with where we live, doesn't do away with where we make entities from and check them against. They have to do it just as science operates in interaction. It, they just don't <coughs> remind you of this. They always say, everything is the way we say it is this year. You know, five years ago we said all kinds of other things and those aren't even there anymore in the library. They're over in the archives. <laughs> history of science. And so five years from now it'll all be different. But that doesn't mean it isn't precious and life-saving as far as we've gotten, whatever we've got. So I'm not putting down entities and logic and science and computers and technology, and I don't think they were either. I'm just saying we need to understand that in a wider frame. And what's this wider frame? Well, it's the implicit, okay. Uh, now that uh, Donna's done with that job, I have to say <laughs> mine is the philosophy of implicit intricacy to keep it from falling into one slot or another. And by intricacy I mean what, let me, let me finish saying, I would like you to shift from the un, the non, the nothing place to the 
realization that we speak from, which they both said also, that we speak from there and we think from there. And where is there? Well, I'm talking to you and I'm saying there is sitting in the chair where you sit. You might just be preoccupied with listening to my words, so you have no other words in your mind right now but my words. But you're not my words. And you're also not hearing my words as if they were just my words. You're hearing them with the implicit intricacy that is there with you. And one of the things that I plead for is when you use concepts and theories and all that precious clarity, bring the implicit with you. There is no distinction between the implicit and the explicit because what the explicit is, is the implicit. When you say something, somebody can tape record it and quote it and that's supposed to be different from what you meant implicitly. But there's no such split. What you said is what you meant. That's why we have to come back to you and say, well, what did you mean? Because we can't make it out from just these words here. So the implicit intricacy is where we live. And from there we understand. And from there we can think. But the trouble that we're up against with that project is that they taught everybody in school not to do that. They taught us to memorize so and so many concepts, maybe three a day or something, and then give them back. And what they called creativity is if we give them back in a slightly different arrangement. If already we change them a lot, then we fail. So <laughs> there's this little zone where you get to arrange something. Uh, that's not thinking. That's rearranging the checkers that you were given. And it's a very important skill to get through their school system. You've got to have it. But that's not thinking. Thinking is something people are rediscovering because thinking means being at the edge, at the juncture where some of it is real and you can say it or think it, define it, and yet it's more than that. And this more is right there with you. And that's where thinking is. And it doesn't seem to matter whether you're an original thinker who's writing papers or whether you're a person a living being like we all are, that's the place where you can think and understand and care about things. It's where you live anyway, except we were taught not to be there when we think. And I'm saying, well, reverse that. <clears throat> be where you are anyway when you think. Now I want to emphasize two, two characteristics here of this positive living Ness that I call the implicit intricacy. And one of them we've done already, it is that it, is, it does not ever consist of defined entities. There are defined entities and we need defined entities to build things in the world. Because you can't build a house if the bricks are changing while you're, you know, when you get half of it done, all of a sudden they walk away or something. <laughs> Uh, in order to make something, and we are homo faber, remember, we are makers. And so it's again a precious human capacity to make logical entities and then to make concrete things out of logical entities, like we do. I'm not putting it down. Again, I'm repeating. I'm saying we have to see that within the wider understanding that we are. Okay. The second thing I want to say is this thing is never finished. Well, I don't know about never. Maybe when, well, no, I don't think it's ever finished. But when we die, there is at least a seeming finish. But it's not really a finish. It's a cutoff. And then we don't know after that. So this implicit intricacy is a, Donna said implying or implicit should be an adjective, and I know what she meant, but I'm going to say it's a verb. The verb is implying. And anything living, and there I include tissue and amoebas as well as animals as well as you and me, anything living 
is not only what it is in some sense right this moment, snapshot, anything that lives is also an implying. And you already know that, I'm just giving it words. Because if that stopped, you would feel very strange. <laughs> I mean, we're always on the way to, and you're looking forward to lunch, and you've got things tonight, and, and life is going on, and even what I say again, uh, what it means is forward, is some kind of a, what is he actually getting at? <laughs> Anything living, but the tissue is already like that. Our tissues are living forward. They're structuring the next bit of living. And there's a lot of ferment now in, in biology and uh, philosophy of biology to say that living things create themselves. They structure their next moment. And what do they create themselves out of? Well, the environment. Right? You inhale and exhale and eat food and all that, walk on the ground. So living things have these two characteristics. One of them is that they imply forward. They are an implying forward. I want to come back to make that difference. They don't just sit there and then also imply. They are an implying. And secondly, they, they have the, the characteristic of being already interaction before they are anything distinct. That the, the, the embryo is already interaction. You don't wait nine months and get a body and then say, how do you do? Let's interact. It is an interaction. We are interactions, and not just as persons with each other, but uh, as tissues already. So now looking back from there to most of our science and most of our psychology, uh, no wonder we're struggling with this non-formulated, non-entity, non-distinct, non because everything that we were taught is couched in concepts, and here now is philosophy. Everything we are taught is couched in concepts that are structured to be just is things. Something is out there in time and space, and it doesn't care about me, and I'm sitting over here and I'm looking at it. Concepts, or I'm measuring it, or I'm theorizing about it, or I'm representing it, those concepts are all of the same kind. They have a certain structure. They are space-time location structures. And physics is already for 125 years past there, but it hasn't brought the rest of science and the rest of philosophy along ver very well yet. Because those kind of concepts render everything as this, this clunk that sits over there in time and space and doesn't need you and doesn't need me and is out there. And that is a characteristic of making. So again, we mustn't condemn it or put it down because here I'm talking to a microphone and uh, we can't live anymore without the technology. But these clunks that are over there without us, that's an essential human capacity. People who study monkeys call it the external tie because monkeys lack it. The monkey can't think about putting two sticks together and winding something around it so you get one long stick so you can reach the bananas. He holds the the two sticks together with his hand. He can't think of the two sticks without himself. Or, or you can say he can under, under various circumstances, but the distinction is not clear. Human beings make distinctions. So we say, well, we can make a length. So we tie them together and then we have a long thing. And we can construct all kinds of things with lengths. Well, lengths don't exist, actually. They're a human product. Mathematics doesn't exist either. It's a pure human product. And with it, we rearrange everything and make things. And it's wonderful. Just don't fall for it, OK? <laughs> You're not the screens. You're not neurology. Um, neurology is precious. It cures people. But you're not neurology. And you're not geometric units. And you're not lengths. 
you're sitting in the chair. Now, why is this philosophy? This is philosophy because one way to say it is philosophy is about kinds of concepts. Philosophy, the way I understand it, really isn't about anything. It's about about. <laughs> so when I say it's the kind of concept that we need to change, I'm doing philosophy. Another way to say something like it is, in philosophy, what the words mean changes. Each major philosophy uses the same old words of the, the whole and the part and the same and the different and the, the body and the perception and the behavior and the, all that, but it means something different and you've got to read it at least twice to get on to <laughs> what it means. It is like that and I'm used to that because uh, for, for the 32 years I taught at the university I had to always convince these good students that it wasn't their fault that they couldn't make heads or tails out of it the first reading. I'd say you don't, it's like a crossword puzzle. You don't expect to sit down and write a crossword puzzle. Uh, well, this, you can't read philosophy that way either. You have to read it through once to see how the words appear and relate to each other and say, oh my God, you know. And then when they translate, they keep you from doing it. And that's really bad. I don't want to get into that. Uh, I want to tell you that in the, in the real Buddhist literature, the mind is in the chest. But translators don't permit English to say that, because you, they say you can't say that in English. So I'm, now that I've gotten this far, I'm, I suddenly have this thought of saying, so I'm proud of the fact that translators tell me all the time also, you can't say that in Portuguese. And I say, well, you can't say it in English either. <laughs> I'm saying it. So the meaning of words changes. The first word I want to tackle is uh, meanings changing is words like mind and body. That what they tell you about the mind, that's not our mind. It's a very useful analytical tool to bring out even more, yes, but that's not our mind. And what they tell you about your body, that's not your body. Be grateful that we have that. That's medicine, that's physiology, that cures, that, that's why I'm here right now. Uh, I'm not going to say that that's wrong or anything, but that's not my body at all. It's, a, it's an analysis of my body that we need. It would be like a photograph with lines on it, or it would be like, like the earth with meridians on it. it. Meridians are very important. They help us find things. The Chinese meridians are also very important because they help us find things. Every theory that's any good at all is important because it helps us find things. Now I, I can use an example from therapy to say what I mean here. Every theory is a precious, valuable thing because when you think of it, all of a sudden you see something that's there, but you might not have seen it if you hadn't had the theory. And uh, Donnell was at just such a point. He said, well, do you think that it's only there because you looked at it like that? No. Is it only there because you interpret it as such? No. Or sometimes yes, but then, of course, that's the, exactly the difference. When you're working with a, with a person, it can never be what you think or what you say. It's always going to be what you think and what you say and the response that came in the person. So I tell people very often that when I practice, I'm like a gypsy that says to the person who comes, he says, uh, you are someone who has many friends. And the person's face falls because she doesn't have any friends. <laughs> and the gypsy says, but very few real friends. Side <laughs> And speak from there. But for some people, it's very hard to go inside and speak from there. And we're not denying that. And we, it was mentioned in both speakers. There are people who dissociate, not in the old sense of what that meant, but in what Donnell meant. That is, they don't look there. They say things that might just as well have been made up, or they say it because at an earlier time it was spoken from there, but they don't, they don't look there. And you can't force somebody to look there, but you can invite them to look there. 
And I invite people to look there. Sometimes I say, what does it make for you here? But sometimes I don't invite people like that crudely. I just say, uh, you have something there that feels, I guess, sort of like, and I say something tentative. And as soon as they look hesitant, I say, yeah, now, now how does that go? Because you have that. It, it knows, and I don't, or we don't. So I want to be asserting that this implicit intricacy that we are, and we are, we're more than an implicit intricacy. We're the person that has the implicit intricacy. And what a person is, uh, in that sense, I'm not going to get into. But I am wanting to say what a person is, and we know this in practice, even if we don't say so. What a person is can never be defined in some final way by saying he's a Ukrainian or he's an intellectual or he's an idiot or he's a pathological liar or he's whatever he is. That may all be true, but that's what the person is, what comes after the is, is never going to be right. So don't put it that way. Imagine that it might be right to say this or what does it bring if I say this? Does it do anything if I say this? And every theory needs to be used that way. Then you discover that they're all valuable. Just about every theory we have comes from some model instance, something that really does happen sometimes, and expands that and helps you see all kinds of things. I wouldn't want to practice without all the theories that I know. And if you have one more, I want it. <laughs> but I would never accept you're equating me to some statement that comes from that theory. I mean, they, I let you do it because I don't mind, but I wouldn't ever agree. Okay. Uh, now, what is the relationship, and this is again now a philosophical question, and it's the question I've worked on all my life, so I'm a little bit ahead, not as much ahead as I used to be, and I'm glad about that. It is a new way of saying that, but I, I usually say, when I was young, I was very weird. <laughs> and I didn't change much, but I'm much less weird now than I was then. <laughs> but now I can say it in a more elegant way. <laughs> I, I, uh, but, but I want to go on with, with my central point, which is going to be the relationship between the intricate that you are and these precious, valuable, conceptual entities that we make. What is the relationship between them? Well, crudely you can say, okay, they're an analysis, they're an aspect, they pull out useful things we make. I've said all that. But that's not adequate because we understand ourselves not only sitting quietly saying, yeah, right, here I am. We understand ourselves very actively in language and in concepts. And language was well said by both of them. Language comes from where we live. It comes. It comes like sleep and emotions and tears and orgasm. It comes. Fresh language. And fresh language is really the only language that's any fun especially if you're thinking. Fresh language is always metaphorical, but it's not metaphors in some technical sense. It's metaphorical, which is what you meant, I know. She wouldn't go for reifying metaphors, surely. <laughs> <laughs> and there would be much more to say about how language comes, how it is that we live in a situation, we interact with people or we're away from people, that's still people that we're away from, uh, we're doing something, and we need to say something. And the words come and everything's fine. But once in a while the words don't come right. Either you don't have any words or the words come and they're not quite right and you have to say, wait a minute, that's not what I mean, I know what I said but it's not what I mean. Uh, 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 and then you can really experience how 
out of control we are from words coming. Because when they don't come, there isn't anything we can do about it except try again. And words always come, but the right words, the words that do it justice, the words that relate language and the implicit, they don't come. Or they do come finally. And then when they come, oh yeah, that's what I meant. Of course, I didn't know it in these words, I didn't know it so exactly, but that's, these are the right words. Very much like when you remember something you forgot. You can go all afternoon saying, what was I supposed to do today? I hope nobody's waiting for me somewhere. What, when, uh, when it comes, you may not like it, but you know it's right. You know, that's what it was. And all these other good things that you should, should do sometime, they're, they're, they're not it. This is it. Except for the fact that this language has never happened before. Even so, it feels exactly like that. It's like, ah, oh, now I have it. My favorite example is an unfinished poem. And I know you've all written poetry, although you might deny it. <laughs> See, why is that? <laughs> we are so shy about what comes from us directly. We are shy about improvising. We are shy about writing poetry. But poetry comes from where we live. And when you have a poem that's halfway working, and then you can't finish it, there are any number of ways to finish it if you have to, you know, give somebody a, a, a poem by tonight because tomorrow's their birthday. You can finish it. But when you have a poem that isn't finished, there's nothing you can do about it. It isn't finished. And it wants something. And you might sit there and your hand might go, you know. Uh, you know, in a sense of one, one sense of no, you know what it needs. And in the other sense of no, you don't know what it needs. And when it comes, you, you, you know, oh yeah, this is, this is it. And there might be many ways of saying it, but this saying is it. You see what I mean? Now for a poem, you're lucky to get one that works, you know, leave it alone. But, <laughs> but in French, it would come out a little differently, and if you thought of an, giving it to another person, you might change it slightly. But ah, now we need a word for that, and we don't even have a word for that. So I call it carrying forward, which is a very interesting phrase, but I won't say why, why I'm saying that. I call it carrying forward, and I've done a lot of work on three or four philosophical notions. Why are they philosophical notions? Because they name the relationship between the implicit intricacy, I quick have to add intricacy now, uh, the relationship between our being, where the words come from, and the words. The words carry us forward. To speak is another bit of living. It's not just an aboutness that floats in aboutness heaven. It is another bit of living. And now I'm here to say that thinking is also like that. That making concepts when we make houses or machines, or we, we know why we're making them. We're carrying forward a certain juncture in living which this thing that we're making is going to help us with it. And when we make concepts, which is part of making things because we think them before we can make them, when we make concepts, we're carrying forward where we live. So back to saying, please don't only think that way we learned in school. Stay where you live and notice how interesting even stupid thoughts get when you look at them from there. How can anybody be saying that? It's very interesting. Pretty soon you see how they might. Stay where you live and think. So carrying forward is an important concept and I found over the years that it also works very well. Anybody who reads me uses it already even in arguing with me. You know, I had a big argument with Gadamer about his fusion and his, th I like Gadamer, his uh, thing about people never understand correctly, they only understand differently. In, in other words, everybody misunderstands everybody else. He doesn't mean that, but he does mean the un, you see, the non. He, he does mean that when you say something to somebody, you're creating something in them, you're not just handing them a brick a message 
to read. That's what he means. And it's quite clear that's what he means. But his, uh, his uh, associate who was arguing with me is arguing that uh, uh, Gadamer doesn't think that we misunderstand each other, even though he says that. He doesn't mean that. He means that we carry each other forward. So I said, yeah, right. You know, he wasn't conscious of using my phrase. Uh, Gadamer says we carry the tradition forward. Well, yeah, that's right. We, we do. That is what he means, and that's what he should mean. So I give you the concept of carrying forward as a token, sort of. Uh, on the web page is a long work of mine called A Process Model, in which I redefine everything. I redefine everything. It's, there's no such thing as everything, fortunately. Because <laughs> it never stops, you see. It keeps going on. Uh, but I redefine tissue process and biological process and uh, behavior and perception and animals and uh, symbols and bodies with a kind of concept that will surely come now, a kind of concept that I'm pioneering, so maybe I don't do it so well. It's uh, a kind of concept which is both the is and the implying of a further step. Everything looks a little bit different if you look at it through concepts of that kind. Everything is not only what occurs, but also the implying of what occurs for the next occurring. And I can't explain that, but it's on the web and you can even load it down <laughs> uh, if you want to. Uh, and you can find me on the web. Focusing or even Gendlin will get you there if you pick the right ones. There are some lawyers in Milwaukee called Gendlin. Uh, <laughs> 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 another, another such term, and these, these terms, these words come from studies. So I want you to imagine that there is pages and pages and pages of stuff, not the process model, other stuff about the relationship that the, word carrying, the, the words carrying forward name. What happens to logic when you relate it to the implicit intricacy? Do you lose it? That would be terrible. Do you get stuck within it? Then why relate it to the implicit intricacy? Something more interesting happens. We can regenerate the units of logic, because logic consists of units. It's basically building a house, building out of bricks, out of pieces, out of pieces of wood. These are pieces of thought that we build with logic. Logic only works if you keep the units the same, Descartes said. Don't drop any. When you do your bank account, you know that. You'd like to add some, but you're not allowed to, because if you do, then you won't know what you have in the bank. And if you drop out some units, also you won't know. So. Logic and mathematics depend on keeping the units fixed, and that's a very precious capacity. Don't knock it. But we can also regenerate the units. We can make different units. We can look around where 35 steps of logic have brought us, and not just logic, but computerized logic. So you take the result from one computer, and you don't even bother to try to understand it. You stick it in the next program, and it goes on like that. 35 steps like that, and then look around to where we are. Oh, look where we are, right? In the middle of all kinds of results from machines that we built that don't exist otherwise. And wow, we look around there, and there again is your implicit intricacy. And I could give many examples of that sort of thing. And there you can regenerate the logic. You can recut the units. You can ask yourself, what aspect of this do I want to do logic on? This is not yet very well understood, because the world likes to divide into simplicities. And so we have, we have the kind of people who say, everything is up for, to you, and there's really nothing on the bottom. And we have the other kind who say, this year's science is truth, and you, gotta, you better believe it, it's objective. And then they argue, and they're right about each other, you know, but not, not about themselves. So it's not yet. So I have a paper on complexity theory in which a guy made a, a, a computer model of the stock market, and he put in the 
the information, and he ground it through all kinds of wonderful permutations, and where he came out was the market average. <laughs> but he didn't think that he could stop in the middle and say, where am I here now? What is suggestive here? Where could I change my logical units? What could I do here with my computer that would end me up not within the same thing that I started with? I think that's about all the time I have for this. I would like to, what time did I start? Yes, your time is up. Oh, up. <laughs> well, that's what you get for asking a question. Uh, <laughs> really, I would like to say very quickly what I may have a chance to say in the, in the discussion. I would like to say, I've already said really, that practicing is very different when you have this. And I know that many, many of you, maybe most of you, have this in practice. It's just that we were all taught that thinking is something else and theory is something else, and so you don't admit it. But when you're in there with one single human being in real trouble, this is pretty much what we all do, isn't it? There must be a few people left who say, well, if you come to me, then I will translate you into my theory and grind my method on you, and if you want something else, go away. But most of us don't do that, right? Or if you do, stop. Thank you. Can you help me get this off? Sure. <laughs> well, thank you, Jean. And uh, um, again, keep your questions, Kissy, or comments, and come up to the microphone. Oh, I forgot um, and you have to put uh, it back on me. Oh, well, I'll try. Oh, yes. boy. Uh, Dive right here. I just want to thank you, Jean, for what you did to where it's getting to you, being where you're sitting. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. It is true, and that where I ended was just right in that sense. It's true that the importance of what I say very often is this. If somebody comes up and says, thank you for saying that, uh, that's what needs to be said. You know, I know it already, but thank you for saying it. <laughs> How would, you, how would you compare your idea about um, implicit intricacy with the um, idea of the Im implicate order of Bohm and the complexity theorists? Well, I don't want to put anything down that's on the road to, to where I want to go. So without being critical, now I'm going to be critical. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Bohm says that he has a machine that's his, his metaphor for the implica implicate order. He has a machine and he puts a little dot of ink at a certain spot and then he rotates the drum inside the thing and he makes these many, 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 many lines. And up to there, I agree with him. So I shouldn't say the rest. Then, <laughs> then he says, if you rotate it backwards, it goes all the way back to being that little dot. And that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean there, I guess, is that when you expand it, you live further and you change the world, and you certainly change your world, and it doesn't go back, and thank God it doesn't go back. Thank you. <laughs> uh, could you uh, say how your understanding of carrying forward relates to the or 
organismic theory of self-actualization. That's a broader concept because it's the self or whatever. But sure. Are they connected, and how do you see that? Well, self-actualization, you mean as Carl Rogers had in his theory? Rogers or Angel, yeah. Or who? Uh, Andres Angel. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I mispronounce him, I think. I mean, you probably pronounce him correctly. <laughs> Angal? All right, I'll learn that. Uh, one of my favorite people. Uh, no, to me, uh, I'm carrying that forward. Can I say that that way? Uh, I kn uh, worked with Carl Rogers for a stretch and learned everything from him as far as practice is concerned. Uh, Maybe after that I learned a few more things, but I learned most of what I know from practice from him. So I wanted him to get all the credit here. And self-actualization. But his theory was really, and he said so too, uh, his theory was really an attempt to express what you discover when you work with people that way. That if you listen to people and if you take their meanings, and sure, you can do all kinds of things. He, he was never just purely client-centered like some orthodox people are. He would do all sorts of things, but he was always looking right at you, and he was always saying, is that how it is? And tell me how it is. And I want to hear how it is. And that was just my attempt to say back what you meant. And when you do that with people, they get very beautiful. They open up, and they become more and more visible, and more and more, and all the, the positiveness in life comes out. And so then he was up against, how do you say that? And anyhow, nobody believed him in those days anyway. He was supposed to be just optimistic. Well, you get optimistic about nature and human nature when you do it that way. So he couched that in the self-actualization principle. So there's nothing about it I would disagree with. But carrying more is different for you, or, or more. Well, it's carrying it forward. Now wait, that's not just a joke. For me, it happens constantly that what I'm saying and how I'm saying it come to the same thing. It's a certain reflexivity. It's like carrying forward carries that understanding forward and comes to me through that work. So I'm being serious, not just cute, when I say, well, it carries forward. What do you, wh we don't have a good term, and my term is is now the term for this. What do you say when you don't disagree with anything, but you just develop it further until it's so far developed that you can no longer attribute it to that first thing? Then you're carrying it forward. So that lets me say something I should have emphasized and didn't. Life process is I'm just going to assert it, and then you can ask me some other time why I can assert that. Life process is inherently constructive. It's inherently structuring, implying a next step of living, not of dying. Of relating, not of destroying. Of building. Life process is inherently positive in that sense. And so, of course, the question is, why do we have so much trouble? But that's not where I want to go. You know, I'll just say for, for, for quick, if, if the whole thing weren't so beautiful, then the sad things wouldn't be so sad. So you can have some comfort out of that, that the beauty is much larger than the sad. But what is important here for practice is that so many of us get so used to working the bad stuff that we miss the moments when the thing that we're working for happens. And we don't need to do that. You can be tooled up to know that even though this year your client or patient is not going to make any progress probably at all and everything will go around and be stuck, by next year you might be worn out, so don't wear out. <laughs> by next year there will be these little, these little instances of life forward movement. They come there. And we want, of course, today if we can, to have our person speaking from and paying attention there where these life forward steps come. But they always come. Now, they may not come with me because I'm a limited human being and they'll go to some other therapist and there it will come. 
And that's a comfort, right, when you practice, that you're not, everybody isn't exactly like you. The people you fail with, other people don't have trouble with, and vice versa. They come to you from other people, and, and, and you do okay with them. So I want to have said both, that the inherent nature of living is positive, is forward, is structuring the next bit of living. And you can be certain that that's going on under there in Donnell's sense, in the sense that it isn't structured, you can't say, but the person sitting there, the living tissue is structuring that which you will be pleased to hear next year. And it might come first in little, little instancings of something positive. Like my person said on Thursday, she said, she felt all obligated about this man who did this and that. And then she said, and you know what? I threw his card away. And went right on, you know. And I said, wait, wait, you threw his card away? You really did? Wow. Yes, she said, I just didn't accept the obligation and all that weight. And, you know, just my commenting. And off she went, carrying forward that moment of, of positiveness, right? It, was that clear? That wasn't very clear. Yeah. Oh, all right. That was that was clear. So we mustn't miss the the, the moments when the self-actualization. Thank you, when the self-actualization principle is evident, even in very small things. Hi, Eugene. Oh, there you are. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask you if you could speak to uh, some of Donald's remarks about enactment, about. Uh, those kinds of exchanges where your attempts to be facilitative don't necessarily facilitate and things get all kind of tangled up and you have to work your way out of it. And uh, sure. I don't know if you can speak to that. Sure. First I'll say what I think is the most important thing about it, which is that w w when we're stuck, the client and I, when we're stuck, that's an important relational eventing going on. And I have things there where I can say, well, here we are, sort of. And a lot of, I do a lot of babbling, I call it. A lot of manifesting that I'm here, damn it, and I'm really here, and I'm here, and I'm here, and you're there, and you're there, and you're there, and you're there, and I'm not saying anything. So I say things like, you're there, and I'm here, and we don't know what to do. And it's a tremendous affirmation of the moment. We're living without crutches for a few seconds. Oh my God, you know. But we're making it. We're there. You're there. I'm here. And we don't know what to do. Or if we have a, a, a conflict, I say, now we're like this, you know. And, and if, if needed, well, uh, depending on who the person is, there are other things to say. But, but the other kind of stuck is when I have made the mistake. And I know that now we have trouble because I made, I said this stupid thing. I hurt this person's feelings. Or I discouraged them. Or I led them to think that I can never be spoken to again with any kind of trust because this happened. I know that that's a big opportunity. That it could come out to be better than if it hadn't happened. It could be that by the time the person goes home, I'm glad it happened. It could also be that I failed to, to, to find that. It's not a simple thing. But it is true that hassles and hiatuses and mistakes are our opportunities. And if I can do that half the time, I'd be pretty proud of myself. I think it's one third of the time that I manage something like that. But part of it is, the, the, the easy part, is that it gives me the opportunity to really understand what has happened in the other person. And I can do that. I can say, oh, I see why what I said was stupid. I didn't mean it that way, but I take care of myself sort of on the side. I didn't mean it that way, but I see really how you could have taken it that way. And yeah, right. Yeah, that is, I would never say that again. Yes, I see. It went right in there, and it, did, it was just what you didn't need at that moment, wasn't it? And I'm very good at that somehow, that part. I'm very good at hearing a person's feelings even though they make an idiot out of me. 
because I'm not an idiot, it's all right. Uh, and if need be, if there's any confusion, I'll say, but of course I don't agree with that, but I know your feeling. Uh, so the, the easy part of it is, when I make a mistake, I get a chance to reflect the person's feelings, which usually doesn't happen in life. And I'm not good at this with my wife either. <laughs> just, just in therapy, I'm very good at it. And that often rescues the whole situation. But then when it doesn't, then it's pretty difficult to come with some, still again with some relational move of mind that somehow, you know, wishes I could comfort this place. Another way that I have there is I always understand that the person on top is a social entity, and unless they're very disturbed, they can handle everything. It's all right, it's okay, it doesn't mind. I know, I understand. And so I often say to somebody, would you please apologize down there for me, for having said that. Because I know you can handle it, but down there it makes something. And very many people never heard that before say, you know, they, <laughs> they can tell that that's true. So where was I? That's all, that's all the tricks I know for that one. <laughs> yes, come on up. Yeah, I just, I just wished I had tape recorded just last week. <laughs> yes, that's a good point. Or well, as you see, here's a chance now. Now I can say, uh, your voice conveys a heavy criticism of me for not having done that. <laughs> and, 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 and you didn't intend that, but I agree with that criticism. <laughs> I'm reading it in. And did you notice that? Did you notice the gypsy operating there? <laughs> there was no relief on his face. What came on his face was, "Oh my God, he thinks I meant to criticize him." <laughs> and so I quickly said, "And I am reading that in." <laughs> but it's true. It's true. The only tapes I have are from too long ago now. Uh, but I'll try to do that. that I don't know how good they were, but they're on sale probably, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody else? We'll take one more question and then we'll let you go to lunch. Give me some trouble. He likes trouble. At this point, people want lunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think somebody may want to give you some trouble before you get to have lunch. So I want to say, if, 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 if I should know you, or if I do know you, will you tell me, please? Because in this situation, I, I wouldn't know. One of, my, one of my focusing partners is here, but he's my partner on the telephone for a year or more, I think. I've never seen him. So I had a big experience. I'm so glad he told me who he was. <laughs> but if you even slightly know me, tell me, yes. Has it shifted over time and moved forward? Oh, yeah. Where I started, we've got any number of people who can teach focusing very much more effectively than I can, and I'm very proud of that. And uses of, to which focusing is put that, that I'm amazed at, and, you know, and I write the, the one, one, one person in particular, I want to say who, I just wrote and said, how do you do this, you know? How are you teaching this? Because I can tell that she gets results that I don't get. So it's moved on from me. Now, that's not maybe all you meant, but... How has it changed? Well, it's changed. Um, the most that it has changed is from, from a psychotherapeutic tool to a thing that everybody wants and can have, not related to your personal problems necessarily related to your thinking, or your work, or your interactions, any of that. That was nice. There's, okay, one, I there's I one more there. Can I have it? Okay. I'm wondering, how do you integrate the moving forward and the positiveness 
With the vet official. With the? Vet official. Vet official. Ah. Well, that you're going to have to read in my thing, because that's a complexity of how something like behavior develops from a tissue process. So that's complicated. But yes, that's the right question. We don't want to have a physiology over here and a behavior science over there, and they can't even talk to each other because the system doesn't work across when we know very well that both of it is, is involved. So that's, that's a nice question. When you said integrate, I, I do get, since we have to stop, to emphasize one thing. I am saying that the implicit intricacy is more organized than anything we can ever say. Yes. I'm saying it is more organized. It's not unsayable because it's too primitive. It's unsayable because there is more to your living than you're ever going to be able to tell yourself, let alone anybody else. And you know that, right? But yet it's a revolutionary thing to say all the same. It's not a lower level of integration, or to respond to a question that was for, for Donald. It's a different, and I you know, congratulate you for standing strong there. It's a different kind of order. It's not a lower order. It's a richer, more complex, more intricate, but different order from the logical order. Okay. Oops. Enough. <laughs> I love that point. I love that point so much.